Okay, section 26.11, angular magnification and the magnifying glass. So it turns out the size of an image on the retina determines how large an object appears to be. And you could show the geometry of it that if your object is bigger, it takes up a larger angle, and that will be proportional to the angle that it forms on your retina. This has a couple of interesting implications, uh, but let's take a closer look at it first uh, and how it connects to things. So the arc length of, of it is going to be similar to the object height. They're approximately the same. So rather than, use, uh, rather than using this vertical object height, we could approximate with the arc length, which we know arc length is related to the radius and that angle theta in radians. That's a key detail here. This angle theta must be in radians for it to work. So that theta is just equal to the arc length over the radius, but instead of using the arc length, we're going to use the object height over the object distance. So that tells us that the angular size or theta in radians can be approximated with the object height divided by the object distance. Now we can get into the implications. So this example of a penny on the moon, compare the angular size of a penny, diameter HO is 1.9 centimeters, held at arm's length, DO is 71 centimeters, with that of the moon, diameter 3.5 times 10 to the six meters, and DO 3.9 times 10 to the eight meters. Okay, so angular size, we're going to use that same equation of the height over the distance. And if we do that for each of them, for the penny and the moon, we can divide it out and we get our answer in radians. Notice that's what will always come when we're using this equation. It'll come out in radians, which we could convert to degrees, the little nicer numbers to work with. And we find that the penny is about one and a half degrees versus the moon is 0.52 degrees. What does that mean? Well, that means if you hold your penny out at arm's length, it looks three times bigger than the moon, which perhaps you've seen, even if you don't have a penny, if you just stick your thumb out, you're like, yeah, I can totally block more than the moon with just my thumb. The moon is so tiny. But we know from this angular magnification equation, that it's just not that the moon is tiny, but it's very, very far away. And so it doesn't have the same uh, angular, uh, distance that it covers on our retina versus your thumb or penny is a lot closer to you. And so it relatively looks much bigger. Right, now we could magnify something further with the help of a magnifying glass. So if we assume an object is at our near point, that's what this capital N is, it's, uh, I believe, around 20 centimeters for most people, but you can actually test it out yourself. That's the distance away from your eye that while your eye is still relaxed, you can still focus on something. If you bring it any closer, you can't focus on it unless you're like squinting. But just with a relaxed eye, not trying to squint the distance away that you can focus, and the object will have some height. So that's our typical angle theta. Well, if we place a magnifying glass there, which notice is now the object is at a shorter distance from the glass than it was from your eye, then that produces a virtual image because the object is within the focal length of the magnifying glass of this converging lens. It produces a virtual image that is enlarged and upright. And you could do the calculations to show, but I'm just going to give you the end result that the angular magnification of a magnifying glass, uh, in general, angular magnification would be how much bigger is the angular uh, distance to the virtual image than just the regular object on its own. So theta prime divided by theta, cool. If you have a magnifying glass in particular, it'll be one over, approximately one over the focal length minus one over the image distance, times n, which notice this parentheses part is just basically one over the object distance. All right, now we could apply this to some other things. 26.12 looks at the compound microscope. 
to, so to increase the angular magnification beyond that possible with just a magnifying glass, you can add an additional converging lens to pre-magnify the object. So if we have the object, the objective can make it a little bit bigger before it passes into the eyepiece. And there's this equation where the magnification is negative L minus the focal length of the eyepiece, Fe, times the near point N, divided by the focal length of the objective, and divided by the focal length of the eyepiece, where this capital L is going to be the distance from one lens to the other. So that is L to the distance between those two lenses. Right, and that's something that's specified in the problems. Another application, 26.13, is the telescope. The telescope can take something that's really, really far away. So the microscope took something that was really close, but really tiny. The telescope takes something that's really far away, but really massive, like the sun, and it passes it through two lenses in combinations to form a first image that's within the focal length of the eyepiece to then create a final image that is far away, but is really, really large. And so it creates a larger image for us to see. Then if we just looked at the distant object that's super far away, that's what these squiggly lines are trying to show, the sun looks pretty small, but through the telescope, it suddenly looks huge. So the angular magnification of the telescope is really simple. It's just approximately negative the focal length of the objective, the first lens, divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So there we have some nifty applications. A couple of notes, things that have to be taken into account when building a telescope are shown here in section 26.14, lens aberrations. So in a converging lens, spherical aberration prevents light rays parallel to the principal axis from converging a single point. So they all converge around here, and so this would be the circle of least confusion where the image most clearly forms. But there is some aberration, right? And that comes from the fact that there, the, the, some of these light rays are a bit too far from the central axis to all converge at the same point. So you can reduce the aberration by using a variable aperture diaphragm, right, where you can bring in something that blocks some of the light rays that are at the edges of the lens, and then you can get a clearer focus of the image. Now, the trade-off here is less light is getting through, so the image is now dimmer. So that's why you don't always want to close down the aperture, uh, but in some cases, if it's, if it's something uh, really blurry or far away, that might be worth it to reduce some of the light gain through. Another lens aberration is chromatic aberration. So different colors of light, if you have like sunlight passing through a lens, can be focused at different points because we know they have slightly different refractive indices, so they'll bend differently like we saw with the prisms. So you might get a separation of your red and your violet with the other colors in between here. Well, what can we do? We could put another material in between to help them reconverge so that the two the differences are accounted for and the light can once again uh, all be together at that focal point and it would become the white sunlight yet again. All right, so that pulls us through the end of chapter 26.